All right, welcome back to the second half of this uh, awesome double bill. I was, I was thinking tonight, uh, like this really is, I, I have never actually shown these two films on a double bill before. I have no idea why that is because uh, these are not just two sort of uh, films emblematic of the noir genre. These are two of the most popular films of the 1940s. And uh, it's, it really is kind of a treat to have both of these on the same bill in one night. So I hope there's a lot of people here this evening who have not seen these films before and are taking advantage of this opportunity to see them on the big screen uh, the way they're supposed to be seen. And during the course of the week uh, when I'm introducing, you'll, you'll hear me uh, now and again talk about why it is so important that we're able to have this opportunity to actually see these films in a movie theater in 35 millimeter because uh, some of you may have heard me talk about this before. I, I jump on the soapbox with monotonous regularity these days. Uh, but uh, you may or may not know that by the end of 2013, uh, the studios in Hollywood have told theater exhibitors that they will no longer be shipping 35 millimeter film to those theaters and that they must convert to digital projection or basically go out of business. So uh, this is, well, it, I mean, it, it's the economics of the business. This is, it, you know, it, I, I don't know if I would do anything different if I was in their shoes. I mean, it, it, it's just, it's a money business and that's the way it works, you know. But, God damn it, I am going to make sure that there are 35 <laughs> millimeter prints of these films to show at theaters that actually can still show 35 millimeter uh, because it does make a difference. And uh, I'm not gonna go into this right now, but during the course of the week, trust me, you will hear me talk about the digital dilemma and how digital is not a preservation medium. Yeah. And if you want to actually have these films preserved, they have to be preserved on film. If you want to, to distribute them digitally, if you want to have the convenience of viewing them digitally, that's fine. You must preserve the film on film first before you can do any of that. That is just a fact. The Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences now agrees with me, and they have issued a white paper to that effect. So, here. <laughs> uh, not that they were actually listening to me much. <laughs> But it's nice to know that they do agree. Uh, okay, so the film that you are about to see is like one of the classic films of the 1940s. Uh, it, its origins begin with a woman named Vera Caspare, who was a novelist, uh, had been a playwright and a novelist, and she uh, has interesting footnotes in film noir history. Uh, Laura is certainly no footnote. This is a, a major production. Um, her goal when she started writing she specifically wanted to create a story that had multiple narrators, and she had great literary ambition. She did not think that she was writing a murder mystery. She wanted to write serious literature, and she wanted to write a story with multiple narrators, and some of those narrators were unreliable, and the, the trick of the book was, who do you believe? Which of these narrators do you believe? So it was like four first-person stories in the book. Uh, Years later, at a cocktail party in Hollywood, she met another writer named Steve Fisher, who had written a novel in 1941 called I Wake Up Screaming that was turned into a damn fine movie at 20th Century Fox the following year uh, that's really an example of sort of a, a very strong early example of film noir style. And Caspare told Steve Fisher that that book was really what inspired her to write Laura and the way Laura eventually emerged as something of a murder mystery. Uh, and, you know, Laura was hugely successful film for 20th Century Fox, but had a very, very tortured production history. Uh, last night we showed two Fox films. I talked about Daryl Zanuck. Uh, Laura was a film that he very much wanted to make, but his idea for what the film was going to be was totally different than what eventually emerged. Um, and that is largely due to the participation of its director, Otto Preminger. Now, Otto Preminger uh, went on to become very, very famous in Hollywood as a producer director in the 1950s. But in the 1940s, he was sort of untested as a director. 
He had come from, uh, he was an Austrian, and he'd come from the film industry in Germany, the famous Ufa studio, which produced so many of the filmmakers that would sort of make their mark in noir. Billy Wilder and Otto Preminger and uh, 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 Fred Zinnemann, uh, Fritz Lang, all these people worked at Ufa. And uh, Preminger was also an actor. He had studied with Max Reinhardt, the great theater director. And he was a very uh, combative personality. And he was working at Fox, but Daryl Zanuck had said he will never direct a picture at Fox as long as I am the head of the studio. They really did not get along. In fact, one of the things that characterizes both of the movies that you're seeing tonight is that the directors of these films were despised by the studio heads who made the films. Harry Cohn hated Charles Vidor, and Daryl Zanuck hated Otto Preminger. But what happened was Preminger was allowed to produce Laura. And the director that was originally chosen was a man named Ruben Mamoulian, who started directing this film. And it just wasn't working out the way anyone had hoped it would, it would turn out. And in desperation, Zanuck actually allowed Preminger to take over as director of the film. And this is one of those instances of like lightning in a bottle. Uh, the casting changed entirely. Um, None of the people that Zanuck originally wanted are in the final film. He wanted John Hodiak to play the lead. Otto Preminger wanted Dana Andrews. Uh, Zanuck wanted Laird Krieger to play Waldo Lidecker, and Otto Preminger insisted on Clifton Webb, who had never made a movie before. He was a stage actor, and if you have not seen Laura, you are in for a treat, because Clifton Webb gives one of the great character performances ever in the movies in this film. And Zanuck was very much opposed to it because he said, I don't understand what you're doing. That guy is gay. I mean, Clifton <laughs> Webb is gay. And there's no bones about it. Clifton Webb never made any bones about it. He was gay. And it's like, but he's supposed to be in love with Laura in the movie. And he's clearly gay. What, is, what, is, what are you doing? And, and Otto Preminger said, you do not understand the story. <laughs> and so, like I said, this is a very interesting film with strange things that kind of stretch the production code. You will see them on screen here. Uh, and Daryl Zanuck wanted Jennifer Jones to play Laura, and Otto Preminger insisted on Jean Tierney and her very strange, ethereal look that she had. Uh, so they were at odds through the entire production. Vera Caspary hated this movie. I have no idea what she was thinking. It is brilliant. But she just, she despised Otto Preminger. And so it was like the most, you know, combative, contemptuous, vindictive thing that created this absolute masterpiece. I don't know how they did it, but they actually made this work. Even Walter Winchell got into the scheme of things when they didn't know how to end the movie, and they brought Walter Winchell into a screening room, and they allowed Preminger to show his version of the ending, and then the studio imposed uh, ending of the film, and Walter Winchell chose Preminger's original ending, which is the one that now exists on the film. Uh, so Zanuck at least knew when he was outnumbered, <laughs> and he actually let this film uh, emerge the way Preminger wanted it to be. Uh, also, what's so memorable about this film is the score by David Raxon. Uh, Laura was a huge hit, and again, it's one of those amazing things where he wrote this score under pressure, uh, he was in a relationship, he broke up with this woman, he was heartbroken and in pain, and he sat down at the piano and he composed the theme to Laura, uh, which is really one of the most haunting and beautiful theme songs in movie history. Uh, so it really, it, it's, it's a treat. This is really, uh, I, I don't really know if I would say that this is definitive film noir. I certainly think it's probably the greatest murder mystery ever made in Hollywood. I don't necessarily think it's noir, but it is, I think, the best murder mystery ever made in Hollywood. So I hope you, if you haven't seen it before, you are really in for a treat. So I hope you enjoy Otto Preminger and Vera Caspary's, so I do that just because they would hate that, <laughs> Laura.